a deaf Julia Childs, and I'd like to talk about how to cook salmon for dinner. I'm not talking about making a baked salmon loaf where you mix it with bread. I'm talking about cooking a whole fish. What you're going to need is a fresh salmon, not a small one, a rather large one, a fish that could feed five to seven people, which means that it should weigh three to four pounds. You're also going to need a fish cooker, which is a, an iron pan with a lid. They make them especially for cooking fish, but you can use any pan as long as it has a cover. You'll need some hot boiling water, some white cooking wine, table cream, basil, salt, some vegetables, carrots, some cut up potatoes, and cut up scallions. First you're going to need to clean the fish. You slice the fish lengthwise down the belly and gut the fish. You remove the head and leave the tail. After you've gutted the fish, salt the inside and then close it up. The fish has a skin that you're going to have to remove very carefully. Be careful you don't pull any of the meat off of the fish. You can't get the skin off the tail, so just leave it and you can cut that off. Then turn the fish over, do the same on the other side till you have a nice clean surface. Be very careful when turning the fish because it can easily fall apart at this point. Inside you'll see that there are bones. Just leave those bones until after the fish has been cooked. Then you're ready to poach the fish. You have a little bit of water in the pan, some oil, some crumpled basil leaves, a little bit of wine. I don't have exact measurements on these ingredients. You're just going to have to trust your intuition as to how much wine or how many spices you want to put in. And then you're going to put the fish back in the pan. No, um, first, if you have a special net or a mesh that you can lay in the pan before you put the fish in, that will make it easier to remove the fish after you're done cooking. When you remove the fish, then you can use the juice left in the, the bottom of the pan for making the cream. So that's why you need to have the net to remove the fish. You can also use a cloth. That will do a strong cotton cloth that you can use to pick up this fish when it's done cooking. After the fish is in, you cover it. If, um, if the lid is a little bit loose, you can use some aluminum foil and then place the lid on top of the aluminum foil before you put the fish in the oven. You then bake the fish at 375 for an hour, perhaps an hour and a half, depending on the size of the fish and the weight of the fish. After it's cooked for an hour, an hour and a half, then you take the fish out, carefully remove it, and then there's juice in the bottom of the pan with your spices in there. You put the juice in a saucepan, Oh, I need to go back. I forgot to tell you that the chopped carrots, the potatoes, and the scallions should be cooked with the fish. After you've re removed the fish from the oven, then you keep the potatoes and carrots separate in a container in a pot, and you have the juice in a separate saucepan. You're then ready to debone the fish. You open up the fish and inside you'll see the spine and you have to carefully jiggle the spine, loosen it up and down the fish so that you can remove each of the bones. They'll be soft and you'll be able to remove them. 
you don't want to leave the bones in because that will be uh, difficult while you're eating. It may take 10 to 15 minutes to debone the fish, but you have to get all of those bones out, and then you'll have a perfect fish. You can put the fish on a, a, on a plate and keep it warm. And then you take the juice, the water and the wine, and put it on the stove. And then you mix up some cornstarch with water. You don't want to put the cornstarch into the juice because it will glop up. And it will make it very hard to, uh, to make the nice sauce. So you mix the cornstarch with water first, and you add some table cream, maybe a half to three quarters of a cup. Mix that in. That will make the uh, juice white. Let it boil. Let it get hot. And then you can add the cornstarch. That will thicken up the sauce. You can add some more basil, perhaps some parsley, chopped fresh parsley or garlic, fresh garlic. Let it cook, let it get good and hot. I'd say it may take 15 minutes. And then bring the fish out of the oven where you've been warming it. And using a soup ladle, spoon that sauce, that cream sauce, all over the fish until you can't see the salmon anymore. All you can see is the cream sauce on top. Sounds good, doesn't it? And then you take the vegetables, which have been kept hot, remove them from that pot, and put them on the plate with the fish, and enjoy your supper with Chardonnay wine, or New Zinfandel, a, a wine that suits seafood. So enjoy your supper this evening. Hello, I'm Mal Grossinger. I work here at Gallaudet University as the ass Assistant Director for the Development Office. And I'm here to talk with you today about my two deaf children and where they will be going to attend school. It's been tough on me and my wife trying to decide exactly what we should do with our two kids. Should we send them to a school for the deaf or put them into a mainstream program? There's been some confusion about that. There is, uh, Kendall Demonstration Elementary School and Frederick, Maryland School for the Deaf, so we have to choose between those two. So it's kind of difficult to decide where to put them. Now it's my turn to give this some consideration, as I know many other deaf parents have had to do as well, in terms of where they wanted to send their own kids. And I'll tell you why this has been such a point of concern for me. I used to work at Galdit as a recruiter through the enrollment office, and I have traveled throughout the country and had an opportunity to see a variety of different school settings, schools for the deaf, mainstream programs, and regular public schools. And you wouldn't believe the diversity and variance between these settings. And before I go into any more of that, I want to make it clear that I'm giving my own opinions. I'm not speaking for other parents. I'm telling you how I feel as a parent. And I recognize that there are other parents who have different opinions. So I'm only going to be sharing with you again how I feel about the different school settings, schools for the deaf mainstream programs and regular public schools. As I was saying then, I have given uh, presentations to many students, those from mainstream schools, regular public schools, and schools for the deaf. And it's been an interesting uh, opportunity for make some observations. The kids who generally come from mainstream schools are very passive. They tend to just take in the information and then don't go on to question or discuss what's been uh, brought up in my presentations. As compared to those school students who go to schools for the deaf who are much more aggressive and interested in making comments and discussing and asking questions, they want to get more information. Deaf students from regular public schools, I would say most of them don't even sign. And I often wondered how it is they manage to negotiate communication with their teachers. Obviously, an interpreter wouldn't do any good because, as I've said, they, they didn't sign. They could use their voices. But it seems to me that there are people who have 
hearing loss who do not understand information 100%, obviously, auditorily. Maybe they get 70 to 80% of that information. Maybe those people who have uh, more in-depth hearing losses, maybe they're only able to get maybe 55 to 60% of the information. And I guess that a lot of it is a lot of guesswork or having to use both audition and speech reading to get the information, but I digress. So anyway, I've had a chance to see these students, and many of them oftentimes come to Gallaudet University as preparatory students or freshmen, and I've had a chance to talk with them uh, in an effort to retain them here so that they could get through their uh, four years here at Gallaudet. And oftentimes they would come to see specifically me, and uh, I'm talking about schools, uh, students who come from mainstream programs, and they've told me how really amazing it has been for them to have the communication at Gallaudet and wished that they had had that when they were in their own mainstream programs. They said it was wonderful to be able to sign in the classroom and to talk with the students outside the classroom about the homework or what topics had actually come up in class. That opportunity had never really been there for them in those mainstream public school settings. What would happen is the student, and again I'm talking about mainstream programs, would sit there and watch the interpreter. And by the time the deaf person asked a question, if he had one, it would be a little bit old because of the process time interpreters have. And what would happen is that the uh, instructor would have to back up to answer the question, and that caused some embarrassment and depression for the student because they always seemed to be a little bit behind informationally than the rest of the class. Then when the class was done, the interpreter would be off in a flash, and while the students were <laughs> continuing their interaction with each other, it became difficult for the deaf student to negotiate participation in these groups. I mean, he would have perhaps some superficial communication with some of the students for those who could do a little bit of signing and maybe some finger spelling. But certainly it wouldn't have the depth that a student could have had with students who had been deaf all their lives and signing all their lives. Uh, and a lot of these kids also come from homes where they have hearing parents, so they can't even really communicate very well there. They're also limited and only able to communicate with perhaps a very few choice peers. This is not the case in schools for the deaf. There's so much more interaction and signing among everybody. Class discussions can happen in the classroom. People can begin building on whatever knowledge they have. They can get together and study and whatnot. As for myself, I went to a school for the deaf as well as having deaf parents. So deafness has certainly not been anything new to me. When I came to Gallaudet and I saw everyone signing, the professors and whatnot, there was nothing particularly surprising to me about that. Now, I did have a few friends who lived with hearing families, and that was quite a situation at times. I'd watch their parents signing, and their parents could sign, and it was good to watch. But sometimes the parents would get so involved in what they were talking about that they would stop signing to go on to whatever the topic was. And my friend would just simply say, oh, I'm used to that happening. My parents do that all the time. Well, I didn't care for that, and it really struck me in a very negative way. I've never had such an experience. It's extremely important for a child to be able to watch what their parents learn from. After all, those are their initial role models. Uh, so even though some hearing parents do sign, there can still be certain difficulties inherent. So when I graduated from Gallaudet and then uh, did my recruitment work, I went on to graduate school. The problem was Gallaudet didn't really offer the program I wanted in educational administration. Well, let me qualify that. They had it on a doctoral level, but not on a master's level, which is where I wanted it. So I had to take the majority of my courses at American University. So now I became the one deaf person in a classroom with an interpreter. And I cannot tell you how incredibly difficult that situation was. I don't mean in terms of the course content. I'm talking about such things as not being able to study with the other students for a test. I was so spoiled at Gallaudet because I was always used to sharing what I learned with students and uh, you know, passing notes uh, to each other to study and be able to have rap sessions uh, to discuss the information. I didn't have that at the American University. The professor would give us a project where two or three of us would have to get together outside of the class to make uh, reports and uh, it would be very difficult, I being the only deaf person in the group, because they only had an interpreter for the classroom, so we'd have to contact American University's Office of Special Services to obtain an interpreter for the after-class uh, time that I got together with people. And then there was always having to set up the day and the time and trying to fit everyone's schedule together and also then let the interpreter know. And I always felt like I was the one kind of making the problem here. Uh, nobody could just spontaneously get together because everyone felt like they were tied down to my schedule. And uh, the interpreter would come and only be here for maybe one or two hours. That was a problem if our conversations went on for 
you know, three hours or more. Then you have to pay the interpreter more. Of course, that didn't come out of my own pocket. That always came out of the uh, special services. Uh, and even if we could get an interpreter uh, to want it to stay, a lot of times the problem was that they had a schedule that they had to follow, so they didn't really have the three hours to give either. So that was very difficult and very much a hassle. Probably the worst part, though, for me of the whole experience was that I had to study for my comprehensive examinations alone. And the reason that that was kind of a drag for me is that because at Gallaudet, usually they have seven or eight students who would get together when it came time for the comprehensive exams. So you'd have half the group maybe handle half of the comp questions and the other half deal with the other half of the comp questions. I didn't have that option at the American University. I did have one student who lent me their notes, or rather the answers to the comp questions that might appear uh, on the actual test, and I had a hard time reading their handwriting. Um, I got to talk with them a little bit, but not much. Uh, again, the problem with the interpreter. Uh, I did pass my comprehensive examinations, but that's just a really, really difficult thing to have gone through. And then I think about kids who are three and four years old going through the same thing that I did in my graduate program, and that's just entirely too tough. So here I am at the present with my own two deaf children, and I have decided that my deaf kids are not going to a mainstream program. I just cannot do that. I know that there's a downside to putting them into a school for the deaf. I know sometimes that the courses such as math and English may be a little bit slower in their pace than they ought to be. Because some of the kids have not had an opportunity to learn at home like some of the others have, because many of them have hearing parents. So they haven't really had exposure to language yet before they come into school. My kids, of course, had exposure to language while they were home. So that uh, by the time they were four years old, they were ready to go into school for uh, full time, and they already had a fully developed language. But what happens is that some of the other kids, because they're not as advanced linguistically, sometimes pull the class behind. Now, in mainstream programs, uh, the kids have to go in there sometimes because uh, everyone's linguistic uh, level is on par because they've learned that since birth on. So that's not always so in the mix of students who go to schools for the deaf. So I think that it's my responsibility to get behind the schools and have them pick up the pace a little bit, uh, pick up their standards, so that they give the students who are able greater challenges. You know, a lot of students think that school's supposed to be real easy in one huge playground. I don't want that for my kids. I want it to be a real challenge for them. I want them to have a lot of homework, and I want them to have to read a lot. You know, because there's a lot of uh, hearing kids, when they go to public schools, do that kind of work. I don't see that happening in schools for the deaf. And I know that because I have a friend who has a hearing kid who's already got some homework. Uh, they have to go to the library, if you can imagine. That's a required assignment for them. But at the Kendall School, there's no such requirement. At least I haven't heard about it. I don't know if maybe it's some sort of age-appropriate thing. Because it is only four years old, my child. And the other child I was talking about in the public school is five years old. So maybe what I need to do is just be a little bit more patient. Uh, but when my son turns five, I expect the kind of work I see going on in the public school with this hearing kid to be going on with my kid, too. So as I said, it's my job to kind of get behind the school and see that these things are going on. But there's also an upside to putting them into a school for the deaf. They have the interaction with other students. Uh, they can build self-confidence. And you've got to know that only a quarter of the information is learned in the classroom anyway. Three quarters of it comes outside the classroom. That's why communication at all times is so important. So I think that a quarter of the information is not all that there is. And I'll give you my uh, honest opinion. The reason that I picked Kendall School as the place I wanted to send my kids is because they have an updated curriculum that's nicely computerized. Now, the Frederick School in Maryland is a very good school. I don't mean to demean it. But if you look at the kids who are 3, 4, and 5 at Kendall and compare them to what's going on at the Frederick School for the Deaf, I found that they're still using the methods and strategies and curriculum that they were using when I was 5 and 6 years old. Kendall has certainly come a long way from that. They've started computerizing. Uh, and I recognize that they have had the wherewithal to keep up technologically with these kinds of things. Even in speech courses that they may have for maybe 15 minutes, they're really fun for the kids. For example, they may try to get the kids to sustain the sound for M. And on computer, what they do is they show this horse that is racing towards a finish line. And as long as the kid sustains the M, then it gets the horse to that finish line. Now, the Maryland School for the Deaf doesn't have anything like that. They're still using the old feather and handkerchief method of blowing to teach speech. 
And uh, compared to the technology that's at Kendall, uh, certainly that would be a better choice. And I recognize that Frederick School just doesn't have the kind of funding that Kendall does for those kinds of things and to buy that kind of equipment. So anyway, I think that's what tilted the balance in favor of me putting my kids in that school. Uh, now, when my kids get to be 8, 9, and 10 years old, I wonder what's going to happen with them. Um, I hope that they'll choose to remain in schools for the deaf. But I have heard from other parents who also have deaf kids that sometimes they have trouble keeping the kids in their school because their level gets so advanced, well, like at Kendall, that they can't really give to those kids what they really need. For example, there are some students, you'll say, 20% of the kids are all pretty much, uh, out of 20 kids, you'll say maybe most of them are on par, and then maybe two or three are particularly gifted. And there's no program to really be for those two or three kids who are particularly gifted. They get put in with the uh, regular students, uh, and since there is no place, oftentimes they're put into a mainstream program, and I think that we need to look for another option other than that. I feel uh, that I, as well as other parents who feel that we, there is a similar problem, need to join together to set up a program for those kinds of students who are perhaps a little more gifted and above uh, the norm. But the problem, of course, that comes up is uh, the budget limitations and how we're going to set up this program. Perhaps what we can do is look at some programs that really aren't as useful uh, in the school and perhaps use the funds from that to channel into setting up some sort of program for gifted students. At the current time, there's no way to fund that. So that's something that we do have to try and overcome. But I would say that overall, again, speaking for myself and uh, my wife, I think that sending our kids to the Kendall Demonstration Elementary School was the right decision uh, because of my own experiences and also because of, oh, uh, incidentally, my wife went to public schools until she was high school age, and then she went into a school for the deaf. Her life experiences in public schools were horrendous. It was very hard on her, and she was unhappy in the extreme. And when she went into the school for the deaf, she said that it was just the most important difference in her life, and she wished she'd had that all of her life. So both of us feel that we have made the right decision, and that's how we came to our decision. And I know that there are other parents, though, who feel that it would be better to send their kids to mainstream programs, and they have a very different op opinion. I think what would be neat to do in the future is maybe to get together and have a bull session where we can uh, kind of try and figure out where the other one's coming from. And I think that this could set up a nice uh, place from which administrators, schools, uh, school administrators, teachers can find the best sort of educational materials and then perhaps can assist those parents who are not as certain about where to put their kids where might be the best choices for them. My name is Mike Bayer. I work in the personnel office at Gallaudet University and I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. I'd like to discuss a paper I wrote in one of my first semester classes at Maryland on the topic of illiteracy. And instead of fingerspelling the word, I'm going to use this sign for illiteracy. Illiteracy is a serious problem in American society today and has been for thousands of years but it has not been recognized until recently because of the dramatic changes in technology. If we look at the years since World War II, say the past 50 years, and compare the changes in technology with the 50 years preceding World War II, we can see how technology has increased. We have computers, television, we have an explosion of communication and information sharing. And this new technology demands that people be literate and be able to read and write well in order to access this technology. My job in the personnel office has helped me see this as well because I interview applicants with low literacy skills, both deaf and hearing. And I will address the topic of literacy in the deaf community later on. People who are literate, who have good skills reading and writing English, uh, will succeed. Whereas those who are illiterate and don't have such skills are not going to succeed in the job market. And try as we might 
to help these people. They're friendly, they're courteous, they're motivated, but they just don't have the literacy skills necessary to meet the needs of the departments here at Gallaudet. And so we need to hire people who have good literacy skills. And it was with this framework in mind that I decided to write this paper and try and find out some of the causes of illiteracy. In America today, one out of every three persons is illiterate. That's 33% of the American population who cannot read and write, even at a second or third grade level. But it's a problem that's virtually invisible. For one year, the U.S. Department of Labor kept statistics on the amount of time lost by companies who were required to send their employees to on-the-job training or training for new technology and so forth. And these companies lost over $200 million in time off the job trying to upgrade the skills of their employees. The United Nations has tested the literacy of approximately 150 countries worldwide, and the United States is 49th in this list. Even though we have this technological boom in America, we don't have the people who are literate enough to access and use these new technological breakthroughs. Businesses' productivity is on the decline because we cannot find enough qualified literate workers. And this is a trend that may continue. Now, if we look at the Japanese culture, they're far ahead of the United States because they place a great deal of emphasis on education and literacy. And again, research shows that the United States is in the process of losing its economic strength in the global market to Japan because of this problem of illiteracy. And we may not be the global power that we once were. So many things now have to do with electronics, cars, VCRs, and so forth. Japan is excelling in their highly literate culture while we, while we here in the United States are not. There's been a lot of debate on who's to blame, the business community, the government, or the educational system. The business community faults the school because they see the students for so much of their lives. Um, the educational system blames the government for not supporting them financially. And from my experience, I think they should each share the blame. And they should work together to reduce the problem. Over the past 10 years, we've seen more coalitions among the three organizations being devised. For example, Project PLUS, which stands for Project Literacy United States. More and more organizations are developing such programs in order to prevent um, the United States losing its power in the world marketplace. Let's see. Oh, what was I going to say? Um, I was ready to say something very important here. Um, well, let me pick up. My feeling is the government should stay out of this. I saw a quote in an article that said, a government's job is to govern, not to run the system. You know, that's how our governmental system is based on the government governing, but also traditionally being involved with both our social and civil systems. And I think that the government needs to stay out of business and education in attempting to solve the problem of illiteracy. There's so much bureaucracy and red tape to go through to try and get anything done. So I think the government should not be involved, but yet support the efforts of the coalitions through funding. You know, we pay taxes for such purposes. And I think the government should leave it up to the business community and the ed educational system to solve this problem. As businesses develop new technologies, they need to keep the educational system abreast of them so that this technology can be introduced to the students. 
Educators often are not familiar with what's happening in the business community, and they don't have time to go out to the private sector and see what kind of advances are being made technologically, resulting in a lack of communication between the two. So a stronger relationship must be created between the business world and the educational system. And I think it's the government's place to foster that through funding and support. And in that way, we can regain our economic power in the world again. And now, with the uh, destruction of communism and the talk of the new unified Europe uh, in the next few years, where several countries, such as France, Italy, Germany, will unify to form one common European economic community, they may threaten the place of Japan or the United States in the economic market. That's a very hot issue that's going to remain so for a long time. Now let's see how this issue relates to education of the deaf. I see one main issue is the ASL English controversy. Last fall, the superintendent from the Mississippi School for the Deaf gave a presentation which I found very inspiring. He said that one problem was the lack of deaf professionals involved in education of the deaf, especially in decision making and teaching, that there were not enough deaf people, resulting in the fact that hearing administrators and teachers were making decisions about the best methods of teaching the deaf and how to work with deaf children. And he felt that it's our responsibility to have input into these decisions that will affect deaf people. But we look at deaf people today, they're going into business and other careers, not into education. I'm an example of this. But we need to see more and more deaf people going back into education. Another problem is the issue of language. For many deaf people, English is our second language. And that's a problem that we need to uh, live with and to address as well. And also, American Sign Language, he felt, was the key to literacy. Many schools or state educational systems do not recognize ASL as a viable language. And that is a continuing struggle that we must face. So it puts us in a double bind. Research also shows that companies are now hiring people with um, bachelor's degrees and above. I tend to equate a current bachelor's degree with a high school diploma of a few years ago. Companies need creative thinkers and problem solvers and I think are going to need people who have an MA or a PhD. And if you look at the numbers of people who have such degrees, maybe only 5 to 10 percent of the American population have bachelor's degrees and an even smaller percentage of deaf people have college degrees. Many deaf people have only a high school diploma or are themselves high school dropouts. So that's something that deaf leaders in the educational system and the National Association of the Deaf must address. We must come up with programs to improve the literacy skills of the deaf community to a certain minimum so that deaf people can access the economic and job markets in this country. If we do nothing, we need to think about what's going to happen in the future. For example, many of these technological changes happen virtually overnight. And if we're not prepared to face these changes, then this problem is going to remain serious for many years to come. I've been asked to talk about what the superintendent of the Mississippi School recommended as far as solutions. And he had several recommendations, and I'll talk about a couple of them. One is to look at consistency in programs to train teachers of the deaf. We have 70 to 80 such programs nationwide but no consistency in a theoretical framework or methodology for preparing teachers. Some support the use of signed English. Others are more orally based. Others look at ASL as a structural framework. So consistency is important in these programs. Another recommendation is to have deaf people very involved in uh, the local school systems and with the government in different capacities, teaching, decision making, and so on. superintendent also gave a good example of this. He told of going to a meeting in California, a teacher's meeting, where he was one of 20 teachers in a discussion room. He was the only deaf person with 19 hearing teachers. 
And among that group, they had between them approximately 400 years of collective experience teaching the deaf. He had successfully produced five good teachers of the deaf from his former students, while the other 19 teachers had produced none. Where are teachers of the deaf and deaf students? And he was not there to fault them as teachers, but to look at training programs and the need to make their methodology and conceptualization very consistent. Another example he gave, he was presenting a lecture to another group, and after he was finished, uh, a hearing teacher approached him in tears and said how she wished she had been aware of ASL in the past. Uh, his lecture had been about American Sign Language, and she said that her program of teacher education had prepared her to use a signed English system. And she was very angry, and he said to direct that anger at the training program, not at deaf people or at herself, because that's where the basic problem lies. And in his view, Gallaudet needs to take the lead in this area, not to try and maintain a neutral attitude, but to take the lead and not try and please everyone. He said Gallaudet should be a model to the world as far as education and preparation of teachers of the deaf, and Gallaudet needs to have a say. And in my opinion, ASL is a key part of this philosophy. What Gallaudet does, he feels, the world will follow. If Gallaudet does not practice or take a stand, then this inconsistency in preparation of teachers of the deaf will continue. So it's a topic that's of strong interest to me and something that I want to get involved with and spread the word among colleagues of mine, not only among the Gallaudet community, but among the grassroots community as well. It is a serious problem that must be addressed. Literacy skills are very important in order for people to have a good quality of life. And if there are deaf people that we can locate who have literacy skills, perhaps they can help other deaf people develop them. And it's something we're going to need to work on for the next 10 or 15 years. Hello, my name is Dwight Benedict. I'm director of Student Life, and as a side hobby, outside of my job, I serve as the winter team director. I am responsible for all of the winter games. Let me explain a little bit more about the organization and how it works. On the hearing level, we have an organization called the IOC, which is the International Olympics Committee. And for deaf people, there is an organization called CISS, the Committee uh, International of Silent Sports. So the IOC and the CISS enjoy equal status. Both of these organizations are responsible for coordinating foreign countries together for the Olympics. And I will be specifically speaking of one country, clearly the United States. Let me explain one term I'll be using, the American Athletic Association for the Deaf. The American Athletic Association for the Deaf serves an umbrella organization for all other sports organizations for deaf people, such as the racquetball organization, the American Ski Association, the American Hearing Impaired Hockey Association, the Speed Skating Association, the Volleyball Association, and so forth. All of these sports come under the AAAD. Uh, also, the Athlet American Athletic Association for the Deaf has one side attachment to the World Games for the Deaf, whose main responsibility is setting up tryouts and organizing the teams from the United States in giving them training grounds and arranging for their travel to the countries where competitions will be held. Now my specific role will be specifically geared toward the Winter Games and I'll be working specifically on five sports that will be coming up for the World Games for the Deaf in Canada for 1991. The sports are the Alpine which includes the Downhill, the Super G, the Giant Slalom, and the Slalom. 
A lot of people think that the Alpine only includes the downhill, but actually that's just one event out of four in the category of the Alpine sport. The next category would be Nordic. It is no longer called cross country, that's an outdated term. We call it Nordic. And under that there will be three or four events. And then the next category is speed skating. It's certainly no cakewalk on the ice. And then there's American hockey, but that will be taken care of by that particular association. And believe it or not, bowling, which is a new sport which has been added. And I'm not too crazy about this, but you have to work with what you have. So these are the kinds of responsibilities that have been taken up for setting up these games. And as director, it is my responsibility to coordinate all the tryouts for each of these categories. For example, in the Alpine category, through the United States Deaf Ski Association, which is a mother organization for the Alpine sport, which is responsible for the skiing on a worldwide basis, the United States bid to be host for the tryouts in Vail, Colorado. And so far, we have roughly about 50 to 70 registrants for the competition in Vail. I have gone to Vail and had an opportunity to meet with the officials there to ensure that we have the correct selection procedure. For example, the hill that we need to use for our race has to be selected, and as you well know, there are several in Colorado. So we have to negotiate to have one of them closed so that we have a slope for our event. And it is quite a costly endeavor uh, with a slope, which will easily cost as much as $4,800. There's no way for us to be negligent on this because we have to set a fence around the slope because it is somewhat dangerous. And so we've negotiated to close down, close down the slope from top to bottom for that particular event. Then we also have to negotiate with the people in Vail for ordering of medals and ordering of bibs so that we can put the numbers on each of the contestants. Once that's been worked out, then we have to get all the paperwork in order for when people have to be at the slope. And they're extremely strict about this. Anyone who arrives after 9.05 will be automatically disqualified. It's a very emotional and serious thing. And anyone who arrives late, there is no excuse that we will accept because it throws off the fairness to the other contestants. So I have to set up the schedule, which will be from uh, Sunday to Saturday night. For example, on Sunday evening, we will have registration for the race. And we also require that everyone attend an orientation so that we can uh, familiarize them with the rules, for example, how to go through the gates, or if they're not going to go through the gates, how they're to go around them. Uh, and also, they have an opportunity to inspect the course. There are some who can go through the gates or around them to check the course. They're permitted to do that two or three times. Oftentimes, they're ready after that, but we don't permit that. We have to make sure that everyone understands as well as the next man. So we have the check going from 9 to 9.45, and then at 9.45, we begin timing what we call a form runner. And the form runners are just two outsiders who can be selected from anywhere and brought in to test the gate and the timing mechanism to ensure that everything is set. And then at 10 o'clock we begin the actual competition. Everyone who goes down the slope will do so at 30 second intervals. So you always have people going down at 30 second intervals. The problem is that sometimes as you're ready for the next person they're still trying to get their gear on and that's one of the areas that tends to be most sensitive and making sure everyone's ready on time. If someone should slip and fall on the course, we have gatekeepers lined up uh, down the slope so that they can radio and tell the people at the top to hold until the uh, course can get cleaned up and the poles put back. So that'll take us through Tuesday, and uh, those are the three days required for the downhill, which comes under the category of speed skiing. And that has four events, and those four events are grouped in twos. There's downhill and super G. Uh, again, those are called speed skiing. And then the other two clusters are the giant slalom and the slalom. And the uh, latter two that I've mentioned are much more technical in nature, whereas the first two I mentioned typically are more gutsy. And for downhill, there is a two-day minimum of training because of the risk involved. And it also gives us an opportunity to evaluate whether or not we feel someone may not really be qualified enough to do that. So after these two days of training, then on Wednesday, they get a one-shot chance at going down the slope. There are no second chances. Once you're done, it's arrivederci, and uh, you move on. On Thursday, 
uh, uh, excuse me, on Wednesday night, we uh, discuss the downhill, and then on Thursday, we begin uh, selection for each of the applicants. Everyone wants to be number one, and there's a reason for that. Uh, when you get down to about the 20th person going down the slope, uh, a rut forms, and people can slip and fall on it really easily. So people generally want to be within the first 10 or 20 to avoid that rut. And uh, a good question might be how it is we go through the selection process. What we do is look at the points that they've earned for a year under the USSCA, which is the United States uh, Commission on Skiing, uh, who have the regulation measurements and the different levels of competitions. And also we look at individuals who have been involved in deaf competitions and tournaments. And then based on all that information, we pick the uh, top 10 individuals who are the top seeds, and then you start going down in terms of tens by second and third and fourth clusters. Then we begin to draw uh, numbers for each of the individuals and begin assigning the numbers, one through 10, uh, on their bibs. Then on Thursday, we begin uh, the competition for Super G. Super G, incidentally, is a fairly newcomer to this. Uh, it used to be only downhill, giant slalom, and slalom. And they wanted to add something that was not only uh, quick, but also involved some technical uh, maneuvers, and that's the kind of thing that was involved. Uh, some people think it makes a plant downhill. I'm not sure that that's true, but it certainly has gained a great deal more popularity. Uh, most people are doing giant slalom, slalom, and super G. There are few who are getting involved in downhill. So anyway, we have this uh, super G, uh, and then on Friday we do the giant slalom. The super G, giant slalom, and slalom are permitted two runs per person. It lets them go down once, rest, and then we reset up the course, get the poles put back up, and then everyone uh, goes down. And then uh, we then change the course. And then of the two times, we look for the best. And you go from one down to whichever the last person is. And interestingly enough, what you do is the person who did the best on the first run will be the last to go on the second run. You have to change everything around. And that way, it keeps everything fair for all of the individuals. And the winner is the one who gets the best overall score. Uh, it's also nice because if someone doesn't do well on their first run, say they fall or slip, they can always depend or at least have a second run to depend on. So that takes us through Super G, the Giant Slalom, and the Slalom, which is very technical and actually is quite a lot of work for the gatekeepers who have to be pretty closely lined up down the slope because the poles generally are only 10 feet apart from each other and as individuals go down them they of course get knocked off and the gatekeepers have to go and put them back. Uh, it's not like downhill where the poles are set up so far from each other and staggered so far away that they don't have as much trouble doing that. I think I've covered most of the sports uh, that are involved in the Alpine. As I said that has pretty well been worked out with uh, Vail and everything is set for March 11th. So that moves us on to the Nordic, which is much more difficult uh, to organize because there are so few participants in that sport. Uh, just last week I was in Vermont, and I think it was just four women and four, two men. And I understand that that's the kind of uh, statistics they have with hearing people too. Uh, it seems to be much more popular in Europe. So instead of having just a tryout to get people to come in, we usually have tryout going on an ongoing basis so that we can pull a team together as we find individuals. So far, we have uh, identified four outstanding men and women. We're hoping to find two more women, possibly three, so that we can set up a relay team for the cross country. And that's the current situation there. The next category then would be the American hockey. And as I said, we'll leave that responsibility to the organization themselves, which is the American Hearing Impaired Hockey Association. They will be responsible for doing everything from beginning to end in terms of fundraising and team selection. Uh, of course, they will be working in concert with two members from the World Games for the Deaf when they begin selecting their team, and they'll be going from there. Most of the hockey players typically come from Chicago because that's where the home organization is. So uh, we try to be fair to everyone in this. The next category is speed skating. And though we have searched diligently, we have only found one person. But it's good news. Uh, when I compared this guy's time, he had beat the Norwegian time. Uh, when I'm speaking of Norway, I'm speaking of the World Games for the Deaf held in Norway. They took first in every uh, event under speed skating. And I found this guy who's beating them. And I didn't believe it at first. So I asked him to send me the sanctioned time, the official times. And uh, sure enough, it held true. So I, I don't want to get too excited, but I'm very hopeful. And we'll be taking him uh, with uh, his team. And hopefully, 
he will be sweeping a bunch of metals for us. Let's see, that brings me then to uh, bowling. What can you say about bowling? I've always thought of it as being kind of a summer sport, but CIS has voted to have bowling included uh, as a sport in 1995. But CISS asked Canada if they would go ahead and accept the resolution earlier for this year to put bowling in for 1991. I'm not as happy and I'm not very comfortable with that. But currently Canada is not very uh, pleased with that decision because they don't want to take responsibility for that. Uh, there's no way to set up a tryout or really a selection process. So uh, next week in February, uh, we'll find out whether or not this is going to go or not. Uh, if it does, then what will happen is that they'll just have to contact the National Bowling Association and they'll have to pull the team themselves. And then uh, we're also responsible for getting parade equipment, the equipment, uh, parade clothing, the equipment, uh, plane tickets, uh, and everything. Uh, we have to raise about $250,000 uh, to accomplish this in order to get to the World Games for the Deaf. And I hope my name is Arlene Blumenthal Kelly. I work at Gallaudet as a research technician. I also take classes in linguistics. One class that I took was called Sociolinguistics of the United States Deaf Community. And this course required a term paper. And I thought and thought about what a topic might be for me. And I have always been interested in senior citizens. So I decided I would do my term paper on that topic. Before I go on, I want to talk about two unique signs. This is the, what I use for Baltimore. And this is the sign that I use for senior citizens. And I'll be using those two signs throughout my talk. Now, before I started my research topic, I did a lit review. And that included Growing Old in Silence. That was a fascinating book. And in that was written in 1979. And there was a study done on senior citizens in San Francisco, which dealt with their, the sociology of their community and language development and what caused them to be what they are today and how their past influenced their present lives. So I thought maybe I would do the same thing with the senior citizens in, in Baltimore, but understand that this was 10 years later. So I contacted senior citizens in Baltimore through my family. I have a deaf family, and I made many contacts. Out of ten that I contacted, seven agreed. The other three had conflicts. Seven seemed to be a good enough size of, for my sample. So I went to their homes, and I conducted interviews. I knew that I must videotape them. I knew that I couldn't remember everything or jot it down while I was trying to converse with them. So I had to set up a video camera for that. So that created another problem. Who would do the videotaping for me? I thought of various friends. And finally, I decided the best thing would be to have a deaf camera person. So I asked my husband to do that for me. His name is Jim. And he turned out to be a good choice because those people already knew him, and they felt like they could be comfortable with him and me in the room. N me, they knew because they had known me all my life. If I'd brought in just a friend from the university, it might have influenced their language uh, choice and production. So after I made all these contacts, I developed a questionnaire. It included questions like, um, what school did you go to? Did you go to a residential school or an oral? Did they use sign language or did they use lip reading only? What were your friends like? The questions were developed from reading and talking with other linguists, and I gathered ideas and put them down on paper. In all, I had about 10 pages of questionnaires for each person. When it was time for the interview, I went to their homes. And that was really the fun part, going to their homes. Please understand that I didn't give them the questionnaires in written English. I knew that this would influence their language use. It might cause them to th feel as though they had to think or respond in English or as if they had to respond at a university level or something. So rather than do that, I used um, ASL to present the questions so that they would, that would match their styles and they would feel comfortable in responding. I went to each home in turn, seven in all, and videotaped their responses. It was really interesting. When I would arrive at the, someone's home, we tended to talk about 
general things. Hi, how are you? How are your mom and dad? And so on. Rather surface level conversation. While Jim set up the camera, we just did rather polite chat. When it was time to begin the interview and get down to the serious questions, and eventually we finished those questions, the interviewees would continue talking about, oh, this, this incident in my past really made me mad, or here was a happy memory. It was interesting how they carried the conversation over, even past the interview framework. When I arrived at home with my videotapes, I would study the videotapes and look at the questions that I had written on paper. And then I would transfer the answers from the videotape to paper. And I would make a chart, how many went to a residential school, how many went to an oral school, and so on. The interesting things I decided to focus on were five areas in all. One was peer group, the second was occupation, next was kind of school, and the fourth was attitude toward ASL. Oh, actually I had four in all, not five. Peer group, occupation, and kind of school, those tended to be quite similar to each other as well as to the San Francisco study. Now what I meant by peer group is who they were with when they grew up in a school for the deaf. As it happened, they tended to have the same friends throughout, from day one in the school until the present day in their old age. They tended to have the same friends on a continuing basis. With regard to occupation, most of them were skilled laborers like printers. Almost all, in fact, were printers. One was a carpenter. And in California, the results were the same as this. Most of those people were skilled laborers, too. That's for men. Now, for women, my results were, the sim were similar to those found in San Francisco. Housewives, those people, you know, they had to stay home and take care of the children and so on. Once the children went to school, they went to work. And the results were similar to those found in California. When it came to kind of school, the general response was residential school. Now going back to peer group, I found that the residential school had quite a bit of influence on peer groups. That's where deaf culture tends to perpetuate itself. My data had just a little bit from oral backgrounds. Now did those people have the same friends that they had while growing up? They tended not to. People who attended oral schools tended to have lost contact with each other. And their friends tended to be the friends of their mate who had attended a residential school. The Baltimore and San Francisco studies had nearly parallel results. Now, with regard to attitude toward ASL, the San Francisco re respondents tended to be more resistant toward ASL. They would say, well, I don't use ASL, I use sign language. Meanwhile, in Baltimore, people would say that they use ASL and were quite comfortable with that response. Now, my next question for research, I wonder if time had anything to do with this attitude shift. In, 1960s, in the 1960s, it was announced that ASL was a language. Now, with the time frame between the two studies with regard to resistance to ASL, perhaps it was still being resisted by the time of the first study and not by the time of the second study. The next issue is proximity. Baltimore is perhaps less than 50 miles from Gallaudet, while San Francisco is about 2,500 miles. Now, whether or not the proximity affected the results is a question for future research. The point here is that language is important to the deaf community and its culture, therefore schools for the deaf are important. I always like to end my talk and my explanation of this topic with something that I took from one of the people's interviews that I videotaped. This is a little poem. The man who, from whose interview I took this was 72 at the time and now he's about 74. When he did this poem, I wished I had videotaped it, but I had unfortunately already closed up the videotape machine, so I really wish I had had it on tape. But nevertheless, I memorized it, and this poem is in me now. He said, I remember a time when there were no doorbell lights, and things seemed so dark and depressing. I remember when there were no phones and no way to contact other people, and it was despairing. I remember when there were no video decoders. And now we have all of these things and our lives are so much brighter.